you have your Bibles with you this evening, I'd ask you to open them to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And while you're doing that, uh, I would, uh, as others have done already today, beg a moment or two of your time. Uh, I know it's late in the evening. I told Tracy I have to speak last tonight, and that means I'm not going to start preaching until 8. And at home, I go to bed about 8.30. So uh, if you nod off here in 15, 20 minutes, just... Uh, 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 adopt the Harold Turner philosophy. Uh, Harold Turner used to say if you took everybody that slept in services and laid them end to end, they'd all be more comfortable. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're going to go out, go ahead and get comfortable. So, uh, uh, I, I am grateful to this church. Uh, it, it has been a, a pleasure. Uh, I, I must tell you, I, uh, I am a homebody. I, I do not like being gone. I, I don't like going off in meetings. I don't like... Being gone from my family, uh, today is Tracy and I's anniversary, and uh, it's, it's, it's hard to be gone today. Uh, it's hard to be gone any day. Uh, I, I like to sit in my backyard, I like to mow my yard, I like to mess with my bird dog. Uh, I'm one of those people that Dad talked about that uh, uh, likes to be all by themselves, and uh, uh, he would say that I'm selfish in that regard, but that's who I am. And so... Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not always comfortable in these situations, but th this church through the years has been its so very kind to me. Th thank you. Thank you for the kind things you say and the, the warmth that you show. It's, it's a lot easier to be away from home when you're away from home, but you're with God's people. And uh, y'all are wonderful examples of the kind of hospitality and kindness that Dad was talking about tonight and that God expects of us. So to the College View Church, uh, I am grateful uh, uh, for, for the week. To the elders for the invitation, uh, I hope that we've uh, accomplished what you are trying to accomplish in this program. Uh, I hope whatever part I've played has been helpful to, to, to you, and I thank you for, uh, for having me, and I thank you for your kind comments. I get a lot more encouragement out of these things, I promise you, than you do. Uh, thank you to these men. Uh, th th there's a lot of things I could say about several of these guys. I, it's my anniversary. 27 years ago tomorrow, uh, Steve Patton uh, met me at Tracy's apartment. Tracy was living in Birmingham when we married. We got married in Dothan, and we were flying out of Birmingham early the next morning, about 8 o'clock. So we were trying to get to Birmingham by 5.30 or 6, and we got to Birmingham and realized that Tracy had left her keys in Dothan, and uh, we couldn't get into her apartment. Steve was meeting us there to drive us to the airport. Uh, and I was just at the point of breaking a window when Steve said, Oh, I, I got a screwdriver. So I climbed through the holly bush and used uh, Steve's screwdriver to jimmy the lock and break into the apartment complex where Tracy lived. What a way to start your uh, wedding. Uh, fortunately, nobody arrested us or shot us or threw us in jail. Uh, thank you for saving my marriage uh, in that regard. Uh, I, I have appreciated so much your work as I have appreciated your family. Uh, God bless you. Thank you. Uh, to, to Jason. Uh, Jason or Cicero. Uh, I haven't known Jason as well. I spent a week with him years ago when he first started preaching. And uh, he asked questions because I'd been preaching for a little while and I still didn't know anything but I still answered all of his questions uh, and uh, now uh, he disagrees with everything that I said uh, way back then but you know that's okay uh, when Harry Pickup died I was talking to Melvin Curry who was one of my heroes uh, on the phone and we were talking about Brother Pickup and he was bemoaning uh, the the quality of preaching that he sometimes sees. And, 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 and he used this terminology, and if you fish, you'll appreciate this. He said, there's just too much top water stuff out there. And he said, if a hairy pickup came along in this day and age, where would he find a place? I thought it was pretty insightful because what that says to him is that we are very satisfied with, with a lot of fluff and not a lot of of in-depth study and, and, and depth of meaning in preaching. Not from Jason. That's not what you're getting. Th thank you. Thank you for studying and working and being who you are. Uh, to Todd, uh, 
It's so much easier to get up and preach when the singing's good. Because we've already been teaching. And uh, you, you do that wonderfully well. Thank you for using that talent. Who, who's the other one? <laughs> I hear all this stuff that folks say about my mom and dad. I've got to spend 56 years being their son. I am the most blessed person in the building. Thank you for caring for them and for having the opportunity to get to speak with them. I don't know how many more times like this we're going to have. And it is a blessing. So, I appreciate you so much. If you're ever through Beaumont, I know everybody comes there because that's the garden spot of the world. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're always welcome uh, at Northwest, and you're always welcome at my house. And uh, I appreciate so much, all of you. We have referenced several times through the, through the remainder, the, the beginning of this week, the, uh, the study that Solomon makes at the end of Ecclesiastes. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ecclesiastes is uh, one of my favorite books. It is a book for our day. And, and we sometimes fail to appreciate that because Ecclesiastes is kind of challenging. It, it's challenging to find the, uh, the organization of the book. It seems to sometimes kind of hop around from here to there. It's challenging because uh, the writer is writing with the wisdom that was given to him in a measure that no other man has ever had. And there's some deep things in Ecclesiastes. Uh, it, it is challenging because uh, it says a lot about things that are uncomfortable to us. It talks about death a good bit. talks about injustice and, and, and talks about folly. And, and, and we're not always comfortable talking about those things. I, I heard somebody uh, one day describe Ecclesiastes in a way that, that was very negative. Uh, he, he said Ecclesiastes is just the... Now this was one of our brethren, folks. It's just the the pessimistic, frustrated ravings of an old man who's watching his life come to an end. I will agree there's some pessimism in Ecclesiastes, which is part of the reason I love the book so much. <laughs> but I want you to understand something about Ecclesiastes. It's not the pessimistic, frustrated ravings of an old man who's disappointed with his life. It is God's commentary upon the human condition. That's what Ecclesiastes is. Solomon starts off by telling us where he's going to end up and saying, look, I, I, I've been given all this uh, opportunity. Uh, he had wealth, he had power, he, he sat uh, over the, uh, a throne of over the most powerful nation in the Middle East at that time. Uh, he, he had servants, he had prosperity, he had wisdom, he had, he had all of this stuff. And, and, and his exploration of life God offered for our benefit. And he starts by telling us where he's going. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. What profit does a man have from all of his labor in which he toils under the sun? Verse 12 of chapter 1, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. I want you to notice very quickly at the very outset, he's already offered boundaries upon his discussion. It's under the sun where I have found vanity, and it's under heaven where I am searching for what is man's burdensome task, as he goes on to say, that's given to us by which we may be exercised. And he says, I've seen all the works that are under the sun, and indeed everything is vanity and grasping for the wind. And so he talks about wealth, and he talks about power, and he talks about uh, folly, and he talks about uh, wisdom, and he, and, he, and he talks about joy, and he talks about pleasure, and he talks about mirth, and he talks about life and death, and prosperity, and injustice, and time, and chance, and leisure, and all these things. And when it's all said and done, we're just kind of mercy. He's just all over the map. Y yes, he is. You know why? Because that's where we are. We are all over the map. We're trying this and trying that and trying this and trying that. And, and unfortunately, we don't read that Solomon already did all that. 
And we know what the conclusion is because it is the passage in Ecclesiastes that we are perhaps the most familiar with when he gets to the end of it all and says, okay, fear God and keep His commandments. This is what life under the sun is about. And I find that kind of ironic. Because God's not exactly under the sun, is He? He wants to think about life in its material, temporal existence and what we should do with ourselves. And so if I have every day to do with something in my life, under the sun, what do I do? But He doesn't go any time before the harsh reality of humans of the human makeup hits him square in the face and he starts talking about life that's not under the sun. He introduces God. He introduces eternity. And all of a sudden concepts that go far beyond his original design are a part of his discussion. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that his conclusion is going to be that life for man has meaning when you get beyond the sun. That shouldn't be a surprise because he offers that conclusion real early. Look at chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes and verse 14. I know that whatever God does... that, that's far beyond under the sun, isn't it? But I know that whatever God does, it'll be forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before Him. The conclusion's in chapter 12, but the preview's in chapter 3. And the preview is again in chapter 5 and verse 7. In the multitude of dreams and many words, there is vanity, but you fear God. And again, in chapter 8 and verses 12 and 13, Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet surely I know it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before Him. It will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. And then finally, chapter 12, let's hear the conclusion of it all, which is just an echo of what he's been saying the whole time. Fear God. You ever wonder where Solomon got that? You you know, I kind of operated under this assumption for a long time. Solomon got that because God told him that. That that this is the conclusion of life, Solomon. This is what my wisdom is is in you so that you can understand, so that you can pass it along to the people, so that you can guide them to me. And I think there's truth in that. But I think it's very possible that Solomon learned this lesson a long time before Solomon became king. David describes him in Chronicles before he ascends to the throne as a man that was already as a young man, a wise man. He knew he was going to be the king. And if you've read your Old Testament very much, you also know that Deuteronomy chapter 17 says the king was to write a copy of God's law. And I think that's probably the book of Deuteronomy. He was to write his own copy. Not just read it, write it. You know what happens when you go read Deuteronomy a lot? Fifteen times you run across this phrase, fear God, 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 fear God. God. It's all over Deuteronomy. By the time Solomon became king and really started looking at life, this was a fundamental principle that was already instilled in him as a human being. Fearing God is important. And I may look all over life for some kind of meaning, and this is why Ecclesiastes is valuable to us. Yeah, you can go try to get rich, but you're not going to be satisfied with it. You can try to have all the pleasure in life, but none of that's really going to satisfy you. And You can try to be uh, ambitious and have power and make uh, mountains move and nations tremble, but you're not going to be satisfied with that. Under the sun, there just isn't any satisfaction. The whole of man, Solomon says, to fear God and keep His commandments. I want you to think about that phrase. There's a, that, that, that phrase at the end, the whole of man, or this is man's all, or this is the whole duty of man. It, it's translated a lot of ways which says we're not exactly sure how to translate it. You want to know why it's so hard to translate It's hard to translate because what it describes goes beyond our ability to put in just two or three words. Fearing God and keeping His commandments is who we are. It is the essence of our identity. It is what we were created for. So, if Solomon's right, 
And the essence of who we are is to fear God and keep His commandments because He's going to bring every work into judgment. Why don't we talk about that more? You know, all we really needed was one sermon this week because the all of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. So let me make a couple of observations about that. But let me suggest to you, first of all, that if we're really going to take this command seriously, we need to understand it. And understanding it means that fear God means fear God. This is one of those commands that we try to explain away a lot. It's hard sometimes to be honest with, Dad's already mentioned, it's hard to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes it's hard to be honest with the Scriptures. Because the Scriptures say things that are indictive to us, or they say things that are difficult for us. And when we're not crazy about the concept, we very often kind of start explaining it away. Jason says some things about the Holy Spirit today. And, and I must tell you, you start studying in depth uh, about the Holy Spirit, there's some things that you probably won't want to try to explain away. And we do that with this phrase. I, all my life, with, with, with due regard to Dad, Okay, so I don't want you to think that what I'm about to say, he did all the time. But that's not the only guy I've heard preach. All my life I've heard preachers say, now fear God means we have to have a healthy reverence for God. And, and I believe that's true, but I don't believe that's what Solomon's saying here. Fear God means fear God. And that's a little uncomfortable for us. The, the Hebrew word, and I'm not an uh, uh, etymological scholar, but the Hebrew word for fear is Yahweh, not Yahweh, the name of God, Yahweh. And if you look it up in a Hebrew dictionary, what it means is to frighten. And, and it's used that way both in its uh, uh, verb form or in its adjective form. You see it a lot in the Psalms in an adjective form, and it's nearly always translated awesome. Not awesome like, dude, awesome. Awesome like, I am scared to death of what I'm, what I'm seeing here. And it's used that way all over the Psalms. There is a secondary definition to revere, but the word means to scare. There is a New Testament counterpart. It is the Greek word phobio. And, 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 and it's used a number of times in the New Testament in regards to the concept of of fear, and it's always used with the, with the, with the understanding of frightened. Now, now let, let me offer a, an observation to you, and, and I just want you to think about this. You may not agree with me yet. You will, but you may not yet. <laughs> you, you know, when we take this word and this concept and we kind of uh, uh, soften it, we invalidate it. We fail of an exceptionally important aspect of our relationship with God, which, if it's not present, is ultimately going to hurt us. We pervert the concept. When we fail to consider that God may want us in some way to be frightened of Him. Jesus uses this word in Luke chapter 12 of God. Uh, and he uses the Greek word phobia. You, you, we use this word as it is. It, it has been transliterated into English. We have phobias, right? You're, you're familiar with phobias? Here we go. It's, it's Thursday. Yes, you familiar with phobias? Okay. Uh, a phobia is an abnormal fear of something. Uh, acrophobia, you're afraid of heights. Agoraphobia, your fear of wide spaces. Claustrophobia, uh, your fear of, of small spaces. Arachnophobia, you're afraid of spiders. Triscodecophobia, you're afraid of the number 13, which I still don't get. If you hang around my dad much, you, you might fall victim to sesquipedaliophobia, which is fear of people who use great big words. My, my middle daughter is deathly afraid of caterpillars. Now, I don't know what the technical name for a caterpillar is, but when she sees a caterpillar, she doesn't go, there's a caterpillar right there. I have great reverence and respect for that caterpillar right there. So I'm just going to kind of keep my distance because I have a phobia about caterpillars. 
Now, I'm telling you, you got a caterpillar, she's going to be in the next county screaming the whole way. She's deathly afraid of... We understand what the concept is. And yet, for some reason, we don't want that concept attached to God. And I'm going to tell you, we live in an age where a failure to appreciate this concept is killing people. Because all the religious world wants to promote is that God is love. He is. Jason introduced this. All these concepts I'm about to talk about have been introduced all week. Uh, 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 what's your name? Steve uh, mentioned... <laughs> Steve, I'm getting older and I'm forgetting. Steve mentioned earlier in the week that, the, 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 that spiritual wisdom ends up in fearing God and keeping His commandments. We talked about these principles over and over. God... God is not love, love, love. God is holy, holy, holy. And, and those are two very important differences. Is God love? Yes, He is. But the reality is what people want in our day and age is not a God to be feared. And that is a terrible mistake. Keep your bookmark in Ecclesiastes 12 and we're going to do a, an Old Testament survey real fast. I'm just going to make reference to these. If you want to jot them down and read them later, that's fine. Uh, if you want to try to look them as, as I go through them. I, I want you to appreciate the reaction of men to the presence of God as God revealed it. So you go to Genesis chapter 3 and Adam and Eve have sinned and God's walking in the presence of the garden and they've hidden themselves. You remember that? And God says, where are you? And they say, we've hidden ourselves because we were afraid. What do you think that means? You go to Genesis chapter 15 when God appears to Abraham in a dream. And the very first thing He says to Abraham is, I am God, do not be afraid. Why do you think He would say, don't be afraid? Well, it seems to me that you tell someone, don't be afraid because you recognize that they're afraid. And he does it again with Abraham a couple of chapters later when he appears to him in, in Genesis chapter 17. Not this time in a, in a dream, it just says that he appears to Abraham and Abraham is on his face afraid. He appears to Isaac. As you go farther along in Genesis chapter 26... And Isaac in Beersheba, when God appears to him, is afraid. He appears to Jacob in Genesis 28 when you have the scene of Jacob's ladder. Jacob's on his way up to Padanaram and he's in Bethel and he sees the ladder and the angels ascending and descending. And his reaction to that when he wakes up in the morning is, I am deathly afraid. What an awesome place this is. And again, it is not, dude, this is awesome. It is, I am scared of what just happened. Exodus chapter 3, Moses in the burning bush. He doesn't understand it. But when God speaks to him, he is afraid and God tells him not to be. Isaiah chapter 6, already been referred to this week. When Isaiah is, is given the glimpse of the throne of heaven, his reaction is, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. I have seen the throne of the king and he is scared to death. And Ezekiel has the same reaction when he sees the chariot throne of God come across the river Chebar as he is standing there and he falls on his face like a dead man. Why do men react that way? Because they're afraid of God. Does that make you uncomfortable? I want you to turn over in your Bible to the book of Exodus. And I want you to notice that this was what God intended at Mount Sinai. When the children of Israel have come out of Egyptian captivity and they get to Mount Sinai and they're surrounding the mountain and they've set boundaries so they don't go up on the mountain... Exodus chapter 19 says that God begins to speak to them. But before He speaks to them, excuse me, chapter 20 says that. Chapter 19 says in verse 18, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. 
Man, can you imagine? Jason said this morning, I'd love to have heard the voice of Jesus. This is the one I would have liked to have heard. Standing at the base of a mountain with a, a, a couple of million people and suddenly the place is shaking and the top of the mountain's on fire and the smoke is ascending to heaven where it's blacking out the sky and it's thundering and lightning and you're thinking, man, what a storm this is. And then there's a trumpet that sounds. It gets louder and louder and louder. And Moses speaks and God talks. And as you get to chapter 20, he offers those Ten Commandments to them through his voice. Verse 18 says of chapter 20, All the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. And when they saw it, they trembled and stood afar off and said to Moses, You speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses says, listen to this, this is... Don't tell me God does not have some degree of sense of humor and irony. Moses said in verse 20, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that His fear may be before you. Don't be afraid. God wants you to be afraid. And if you think I'm misinterpreting that, flip over to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy in chapters 4 and 5 Moses, 40 years later, is recounting these very events to the children of the people that were there. Some of these people in Deuteronomy would have been kids and teenagers. They would have been there at that mountain. And Moses is recanting, recounting all those things that were, that were done. In chapter 5, he, he once again gives the Ten Commandments. In verse 22, he says, These words the Lord spoke to your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire and the cloud. He paints the picture. And when he gets to verse 25 or verse 24, the, the, the people come to him and say, Surely the Lord has shown us His glory and His greatness, and we've heard His voice from the midst of the fire, and we've seen this day that God speaks with man, and, and He still lives now. Therefore, why should we die if the great fire consume us? If we hear the, the, the voice of our Lord anymore, we're going to die. And, and so verse 27, you go near and hear, which is exactly what we're told back in Exodus 20. Listen to God's reaction to that. Verse 28. The Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I've heard the voice of the words of this people that they have spoken. They are right in all they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments. Some versions put always before fear me. Oh, that they would always fear me and keep my commandments. That's what God wanted. Why? Well, there's an interesting... Oh, a contrast in the early chapters of Deuteronomy because they're about to go into the promised land and take the land. And they've already heard from the spies 40 years earlier. There's big walled cities there. There's great big giants there. The land eats up its inhabitants. And so God begins telling them through the first three chapters of Deuteronomy, I think five different times. So, yeah, there's giants there. Don't be afraid of them. Yes, there are walled cities there. Don't be afraid of them. Yes, there are standing armies there. Don't be afraid of them. Oh, I understand it is, a, it, it, it is an overwhelming land compared to Egypt. Don't be afraid of them. And then starting in chapter 4, the same number of times through chapter 7, he says, fear God. Fear God, fear God, fear God, fear God. Do you get that? Don't be afraid of them. You be afraid of me. Why? Because at the end of Deuteronomy in chapter 30, God says, look, I've said before you today a blessing and a curse. You can obey me and I'll bless you. you. You can disobey me and I'll curse you. But you need to understand who's got the power. If you're going to be afraid of someone, don't be afraid of them. As Jesus says in Luke chapter 12 to His apostles, don't be afraid of a man who can kill you but can't take your soul. I'm going to tell you who you ought to be afraid of. Be afraid of God who can destroy both your soul and your body. Now, now I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's a, that is a principle that I believe establishes a spiritual reality. Just like the Old Testament very often in physical ways points to spiritual truth, I would propose to you that this is supposed to point to a spiritual truth which says God needs some degree of fear attached to Him. You see it all over, and yet we, we don't make the connections. 
Romans chapter 11, when he's telling the Gentiles, yes, you've been grafted into the olive tree, and God rejected the Jews because they rejected Him, but you need to be afraid. Behold the goodness and the severity of God on those that fell severity, on those that are obedient, goodness. But then He warns them, if you're not careful, He can cut you off just like He cut them off. And, and we fail sometimes to appreciate why God wants that principle. What we need in this day and age desperately, just like proper understanding of spiritual wisdom, we need a proper understanding of God who's holding this cup of wrath that we're pouring everything in and understand what God is capable of. And not only capable of, but what He will do. He'll bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. And I want you to understand something, folks. The judgment of God is a fearsome consideration. What do you learn about God when you read your Old Testament? A whole lot of things. In Genesis chapter 6, you learn that God killed every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth with the exception of Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And that's kind of clinical to us, but it happened. And it had to be brutal. And it had to be ugly. Those people have to be banging on the, on the ark. Let us in. The, the trees are being covered up. The mountains are being covered up. They're treading water. They, they've got their babies on their back. They're trying to survive. The ark is floating and everybody around them is dry, dying. Let us in. God killed those people. Move forward a few chapters to Genesis chapter 18 and 19 and God sends a message to Lot. The, the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah have come up before me. It's an abomination and I'm going to destroy them. And you better take what's yours and get out of town. And God rained fire and brimstone upon those cities and He killed people. In Exodus chapters 3 through 10, God sent plagues upon the land of Egypt. You know, folks, when those plagues were over, those folks weren't all sitting around going, man, this has kind of been a hard, rough stretch for us. No, people died. And the firstborn were killed. And, and I'll tell you, there's a powerful lesson there because then God tells His people, everyone that's born to you, the firstborn, you need to buy back from me because I killed all those people in Egypt. It's powerful. It's fascinating. Children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. I don't know how many there were of them. What, 600,000 men who were of the age that they could fight. Most estimates are probably 2 to 3 million people. Everybody above the age of 20, with the exception of, of uh, Joshua and Caleb, they died. And God killed them in some crazy ways. Fire from heaven, snakes among them, earth opening up and swallowing them, plagues. God killed them. And then He took Joshua... And those, the next generation sent them into the land of Canaan, and after 400 years of the iniquity of the Amorites, when their cup was full, he had them kill all them. I was studying with a man years ago, and he said, I can't believe the Old Testament. Why? Because God killed all those people. Now, it would be an interesting study to talk about that. But what I want you to see is the judgment of God. And when we don't read our Bibles, and all we do is listen to the, to the guys selling snake oil and, and, and getting thousands and thousands of people to come to their, to their conventions and buy their books so they can have another jet plane to fly around on, the false prophets, if that's all we listen to, we don't see God as God portrays Himself. God needs to be feared because of what He can do to me. Again, this has been read earlier, but Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, says, 
In accordance with your hardness and impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of the wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish on every soul of man who does evil the Jew first and also to the Greek. That is an uncomfortable thing. And we don't like in our day that picture of God. But Solomon said, fearing Him is man's all. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, first of all, fear means fear. Is everybody on page with me? You get that? You get the point? Okay. Second point is, it's fear that prompts obedience. Again, this is an element we don't underscore because we are prone to say we love prompts obedience, and it does. But there's an interesting connection here. God uses this argument a number of times in the Scriptures, and we are familiar with it in other areas, that, that, that the idea of compliance very often is born out of fear. In Romans chapter 13, when Paul writes to the Roman brethren about civil government. You ever read that closely? Why, saw, why, why Paul tells them to comply with civil government? You, you know what the reason is? <laughs> Listen, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do you know what he's arguing as the motivation behind compliance with civil government? Because you're afraid of getting caught and being punished. We left out of here the other morning. By the way, it's 20 miles an hour down here in this school zone. And maybe they haven't turned the lights off yet because it's summertime. Okay, But there's a school zone, and it's flashing. And we were following someone to lunch, someone who won't be named from Arkansas in a black pickup truck. And there's three or four cars behind us, and we pull onto Pine Street, and here's this big flashing yellow light that says, you can go 25, and the person from Arkansas in the black pickup truck, who's a really good song leader, he's driving about 45. And he's going through the lights, and I'm never going to catch him. He is completely unafraid of the authorities. <laughs> you want to know why I went 25? I love Alabama because my wife's from Alabama. But it wasn't because I have such great reverence for your law. It's because I'd seen a cop sitting there this morning, the, the morning before, and if, if I went faster, I was going to get a ticket. It was pure fear. That was the reason for my compliance. And don't tell me you don't do the same thing. And that's Paul's point. If you go to the book of Proverbs, where Solomon's talking a number of times about rearing children, he very often uses the imagery of, of the rod of correction. He uses it in Proverbs 22, he uses it in Proverbs 23, he uses it in Proverbs 29. Beat your child with a rod, he won't die. Man, my kids love it when I quote that one to them. <laughs> but do you know what his argument is? If they learn punishment from you, they'll learn to fear punishment when the punishment is much more severe. It is the fear of punishment that is the beginning of understanding of authority and compliance, which is why Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 says the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. I start learning about God when I learn about His authority and what He can do and what He will do and what He won't do and the circumstances behind it. And so he goes on a couple of chapters and Solomon says to his children again in Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. Why? Because God's going to punish those who engage in evil. Now, now that's a principle we understand raising our kids. It's a principle that we understand when it comes to, to, to our civil government. But it has fallen out of popularity in our day and age. We live in a little community We've been there for a long time. We know a lot of people there. It has been a blessing that, that the local church has been so kind to us and, and that God has allowed us to raise our children here. 
And I know a lot of people in the community as a result of soccer and band and board meetings and this, that, and the other. And I'm amazed there's a lot of very conservative people in Lumberton, Texas, until God tells them to do something they don't particularly like. And so they'll put on their Facebook page some scripture of the day and how much comfort that it gives them. In the next page, they're in a bikini floating down the, the Guadalupe River with beer. And I look at those and go, wait a minute, there's a kind of a disconnect here. I like this part about God. As Gandhi said, I like your, your Christ but not your Christians. I like this part about God, but I don't particularly care what God has to say about this part over here. That's what's wrong with our world, folks. We pick and choose. And, and don't just think about all those heathens out there that are doing that. We pick and choose. What we want God to authorize or prohibit. And because we don't have a healthy fear of Him, we don't obey Him. And that's disheartening to me. And my suspicion is it is disheartening to God. And we get around that by emphasizing other aspects of God. God is love. God is mercy. God is grace. Look at the songs we sing. I appreciate the song selection. Because a lot of modern songs are, oh, I am so terrible. I am, uh, with due respect, it's a wonderful song. I'm so in need Oh, I've got to have God's mercy. I've got to have God's grace. I'm going to throw myself at His feet. Well, that's good. We need all that. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. It is a hard, lot harder to get up every day and go obey God than it is to mess up and just beg Him to take care of us anyway. Do you think that's what God wants from us? Do you think that's why Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Or why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 when He's talking about false prophets who's leading people to the, 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 the wide gate and the, the broad way. Not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. He that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You, you young folks, I, man, do not get caught up in the garbage thinking of the religious world around us. If you're going to serve God, you got to get up and go do what God says. Because the whole of man is not only fearing Him, it is keeping His commandments. And that is an indication of our reverence, but it's also an indication of respecting who He is and what He can do. And it is important. I was talking to somebody earlier. Uh, sometime when you have time, go peruse again Leviticus. In the middle chapters of Leviticus, uh, starts around chapter 18, I think. You have a lot of uh, repeated commands that you find in Exodus. But the difference in a lot of those commands is that uh, God will make a command and then at the end of the command He will say, I am Yahweh. Uh, be holy. I am Yahweh. Uh, one of them is rise up before the gray head. I am Yahweh. Uh, don't uncover the nakedness of whoever. I am Yahweh. Don't, uh, don't uh, reap the corners of your fields. I am Yahweh. And, and he does that over and over and over. Chapter 19 and 20 and then again maybe in chapter 25. Go, go look at it and start marking it. You'll, you'll have freckles all over your page because God says it so many times. You know what he's saying there? Don't do it because I said don't do it. Because I'm God, I determine what's right and wrong and I expect compliance with my laws. And again, there's just a lot of people that go, you know, I don't want that kind of God. I don't want some megalomaniac who has arbitrarily decided what we need to do and not do and, and is just trying to tell me everything He wants me to do because He, is, he, he wants some kind of glory uh, and He gets that by making us His slaves. Man, again, read your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6, when God tells the children of Israel... I want you to take your children I want you to talk to them when you rise up and when you lie down and when you're walking by the way so that when you come into the land and you're enjoying all this prosperity that we talked about earlier in the week so you don't forget about me, make sure you talk about me. And when you get to the end of chapter 6, he says, it is for our good always and it will be to our righteousness. And that's the part about obedience to God that we need to underscore. My life is better when I am obedient. It is to our benefit that God has given us commandments.
If I am faithful to my wife, which I have been for 27 years, my marriage is better. Adultery doesn't help. If I am faithful to my local congregation, which is a principle all over the New Testament, I'm going to receive spiritual strength being a part of a house that God has built. If I raise my children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, I'm not going to come back in 20 years and agonize because my children are no longer serving the Lord. What God asks us to do is to our benefit. And here's the, the most fascinating thing about that. I told you that, that uh, Deuteronomy uses this fear God phrase over and over and over. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12 and 13, I want to read to you. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes that I command you today. I want you to understand that fear and obedience is the first step towards love. And for some reason, we, we have a, a, a hard time harmonizing the concept of love and fear as if they are mutually exclusive. You'd never see this aspect of my dad. But since you think he's so wonderful, let me give you a little perspective from a son. When I was about 16 years old and full of juice, dad and I had an argument in the living room. And Mom and I were going somewhere, and Mom was out in the car, sitting in the driveway, waiting for me. And I made some smart aleck comment to my dad, and while he is replying with an argument that I'm sure didn't come close to mine, I turned my back on him and walked out the front door while he was talking. I just marched myself out and got in the car. I said, come on, Mom, let's go. And we looked up, and he came around the corner. When my dad gets mad... He shakes. Shakes now because he's old, but, but when, when he was... <laughs> sorry, Dad. <laughs> when he was young, he'd get mad. He'd shake, and, and he's standing. I can, I can close my eyes and see it. He's standing at the front door and going, You! Get up here! And Mom said, You better go up there. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to go up there. He's going to kill me. Let's go. I was scared of my dad. but I love you more than I could ever express and always have. And we understand that, don't we? You want to know part of the reason that I love him? is because of that fear. Because what we learn as children is that fear gives us a healthy appreciation for the power. And because of that, we comply. And when we comply, the power instead of punishing rewards. When my kids were little, I'd whip them. Yes, I would. Call CPS. I don't care. They're old enough now. It doesn't count anymore. I'd take them and pick them up and physically overwhelm them and carry them into their room and put them on the bed and hold them down while they're wiggling to get away and I would spank those little girls. And it didn't take them long to figure out that Daddy was stronger than they were. But if I told them to do something and they did it, I could pick them up. Same strength. I could pick them up, take them out, throw them in the front seat of the truck, drive down to Dairy Queen and get a blizzard. That was a whole lot better. Because I didn't want to spank them. And the power that spanked them was the power that really wanted to reward them. And when they complied, it allowed me to show what I really wanted was to shower them with goodness. And that is exactly the way God works. We fear God so we can come to an appreciation of God so we can see what God can do and then really appreciate what He has done. Which leads me to the final observation. Fear means fear. And fear leads to obedience, which ultimately leads to love. And it is in some ways the power of God that scares us that so attracts us. And I think that is a principle that you see repeatedly in the Scriptures because God designed it that way. It's a thunderstorm season. One of them rolled through a couple of nights ago here. We grew up in West Texas, and you can see the thunderstorms coming from a long way. And I was always intrigued by them. 
Uh, and, and I still am. When a thunderstorm comes rolling in, and you, you hear the rumbling, you see the lightning in the distance, my girls get nervous. You know, power went out here a while back, and you would have thought the world was coming to an end. And, and, and they get nervous, and the dog gets nervous, and the dog goes and hides in his, in his dog box, and, and everybody's, oh, the storm is coming. And then all of a sudden it starts popping, and the trees are blowing, and the wind and the rain, and, and I've got a lawn chair sitting in the edge of the garage watching the show because it fascinates me. And we do that with a lot of things. Have you noticed? You ever go see the Grand Canyon or something like that? You know, if, if the edge of the Grand Canyon is right here, we, we back over here going, whoo, that's a big old hole. No. We're like, man, is that not impressive? We want to be close because there's something about the, the majesty. That's why people go to the ocean. That's why people go to the mountains. That's why people go to the zoo. Nobody gets in line to see the flamingos. We want to see the stuff that can kill us. The alligators and the crocodiles and the gorillas and the bears and the lions. And you get one of those lions roaring and people come running from all over. Why? Because of the power. And that is fascinating to me. It appeals to something within us. It appeals to the fact that there is something greater than us. There is something stronger than us. There is something that, that could destroy us. And that is appealing. In Exodus chapter 33, when Moses has interceded after the golden calf incident, there's an interesting little conversation he has with God when God says, I'm not going with you to the promised land because the people you brought out of Egypt have defiled themselves. And Moses keeps saying, no, it's your people. And God keeps going, no, it's your people. Finally, Moses convinces God. It's fascinating that, to go with them. And it's at that point in Exodus chapter 33, I think it's verse 17, 18. And Moses says, would you show me your glory? For 40 years, he's been serving the Lord. He has seen God's power up close and personal, has in some ways been the channel of such. Why is it such a big deal for him to see God Oh, I understand that. Because I am attracted. Because of that power and that majesty. That is the God we all want. It is the God we all need. We need a God that's omniscient. There's no limits to what He is, can do and what He knows. We need a God that is omnipotent. We need a God that is limitless. We need a God who is not bounded by time. We need a God that transcends this world so that we can fear Him because life under the sun is vain. But fearing Him is not vain because He transcends life under the sun. And when we come to an appreciation of the awesome, fearful power and majesty of God, and then realize, as has been underscored over and over this week, all that power was exercised for me. Do you deserve it? Do you deserve the creation? Do you deserve the blessings? Do you deserve Jesus hanging on a cross? Do you deserve the Spirit revealing the mind do you, do you deserve the spiritual wisdom? Power capable of global destruction. 2 Peter chapter 3. Earth's going to be on fire and the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. And that's a scary picture. Except to God's people. Because that's the same power that says, I can raise you from the dead. That's the same power that says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. And with every temptation, I'll make sure you have a way to escape. You ever thought about that? How many times are you tempted during the day? Let's just say we're all tempted five times. Are y'all counting number? How many people here tonight? Are y'all counting? It's not a trick question. Somebody say yes or no. We're not counting. Let's say there's 200 people in here. We've all been tempted five times today. That's a thousand temptations that God's had to deal with. And that's just this little group. And you start thinking about God in those terms, thinking, man, I don't see how God can deal with that. I don't see how God can, can know everyone in all the world and what they're dealing with and what their temptations are. And not only what their temptations are, but how to make sure there's a way of escape of those temptations. 
Man, that requires some power. Power that's exerted so that we don't have to worry about our temptations. Is that impressive? Limitless power that can destroy the universe who says, don't get caught up in covetousness. Hebrews chapter 13. The Lord said, I, I, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. So we can boldly say, I'm not afraid what man's going to do to me. Why? Because God's on my side. Read Romans chapter 8 as we finish these thoughts. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse uh, 20, 28. We know all things work together for good to those who love God. That doesn't mean everything that happens in your life is going to have something good come out of it. I'm sorry, it's not what it means. What it means is everything God has done for our salvation works to our salvation. All things work together for good to those who love God, whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren, whom He predestined, He called, whom He called, He justified, whom He justified, He glorified. So what do we say to these things? If God's for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us. How is He not with Him going to freely give us all things? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? It's God that justifies. He's the one that could charge, but He's the one making us innocent. Who is He that condemns? Well, the judge can condemn, but it is Christ who died, who is at the right hand of God making intercession. He's the judge and He's interceding for us when He's the only one that could condemn us. Who's going to separate us from that kind of love? Distress, persecution, tribulation, peril, nakedness, the sword. For your sake we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. All these things and all these things, we're more than conquerors. I'm, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm scared to death of what God could do to me. But how can we not love what He has done to us and for us? There are th four pictures in the Bible where God reveals Himself sitting on His throne. Three of them we're very familiar with. Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 3. Revelation chapter 4 is probably the one they're the most familiar with. And the other one's actually in Exodus chapter 24 when Moses and the elders eat with God on the mountain. And there are some similarities between all those about the way that God presents Himself. There, there's always uh, a separation, some kind of a sea of glass. And, and, and there's always a throne in the distance. And there's always a, a being on the throne that can be made out. There's, a, there's one sitting there. But there's also lights and lightning and trumpets and smoke and fog. And, and you can't ever see the face of the one sitting on the throne. Just like God told Moses, you, you, you can't see my face. I can show, I'll show you from, from behind, but you can't see my face. And one of the most powerful images in the Bible is in the end of Revelation when we're told that we're going to get to see the face of God. Now, as we finish and as we're about to sing this invitation song, I want you to think about this. You and I are going to get to see the face of God. What's He going to look like? One picture of God in the Bible offered in Luke chapter 15 is the face of a father who sees his son coming home. Who sees him afar off and goes running down the road rejoicing. I'm sure tears flowing down his face throwing his arms around this kid that's been living in the hogs who stinks and is ridiculous Bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals, slaughter the fatted calf. The sun is home. It is time to rejoice. Man, can you get the picture of that man's face? The other picture is Hebrews chapter 10. For those who've trampled underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ and counted that blood with which they were sanctified an unholy thing and done despite to the Spirit of grace. I, I have in my mind <laughs> the face of my dad standing on the front porch going... <laughs> and here's the fascinating thing that we have underscored all week that I would leave you with. You get to choose the face you see. I get to choose the face I see. 
If I fear God and keep His commandments because this is my all, I have nothing to fear on the day of judgment because the power that could destroy me is the power that's going to transform me. But rest assured, and God has proven Himself faithful, that if we do not fear Him and keep His commandments, that face which will be the last thing we see before we spend an eternity in condemnation, will show the fullness of the cup of His wrath. And I don't want to see it, and you don't want to see it, and nobody else out there wants to see it. So, what are you going to do with that? What face do you choose? Will you come while we stand and while we sing? Bring Christ your broken heart.